On this edition of Native Report, we travel to Kansas City, Missouri and visit the Kansas City Indian Center. We then meet Commander John Harrington, the very first Native American to fly in space. And then we meet ethnobotanist Linda Black Elk. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Blandin Foundation, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, and the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to Native Report. I'm Michael Lagarde. Following World War II with government relocation and training programs and with the formal policy in the 1950s of reservation termination, Native Americans were being relocated to urban settings. One city to feel this growth in the Native American population is Kansas City, Missouri. To meet the needs of the community, the Kansas City Indian Center operates as the area's only multi-purpose social service agency for Native Americans. Join us now as we visit the center. The metro area of Kansas City, Missouri is home to an approximate 30,000 Native Americans representing around 100 Native Nations. There are no federally recognized tribes in Missouri, but the area around the Kansas City Indian Center is considered the hub of Native American life. There are no reservations in Missouri, not that because there weren't any Indians <laughs> there, but because they were all moved from Missouri and <clears throat> relocated to Oklahoma. In some places where there's a high concentration of Indian people or a certain neighborhood where folks live, and we don't have that in Kansas City. We're, we're all over the metro. So when we're providing services here, we want to make sure that we're as welcoming and sensitive to everybody's needs. So whether you're, you know, from up north or south or east or west, that we're, we're providing services in a way that's comfortable and welcoming to people. We're here to help people, um, first and foremost, and that we want to help connect them to their, to their other relatives that live here. So they have kind of a, a home away from home. Uh, a lot of times people just come here for that. Uh, just for that, you know, connection of being around other Indian people where you don't have to, you know, explain things. You know, people that just already kind of know where you're coming from. Incorporated in 1971 as Heart of America Indian Center Incorporated, the Kansas City Indian Center plays an important role within the Native community by providing Native services to Native and non-Native populations. And then this is uh, the board in, I want to say, 74, 75, um, the board of directors. Uh, we incorporated in uh, 1971. And, um, but before that, it was just uh, a group of Indian people that would help the other ones that were coming, you know, so whether it was with housing or a place to stay or jobs or childcare, you know, they were just helping each other and as more of a, a social club. A couple of our longest standing programs are Morningstar Outreach Program. We provide behavioral health and substance abuse outpatient treatment and prevention programs. So we do wraparound programming for that. We have case management in addition to therapy and um, outpatient treatment. Uh, we have two social workers here. Um, Patrick does our therapy. He's a licensed clinical social worker, so he does the behavioral uh, health. And then Kelly Walker, she does, is a social worker and she provides case management for, um, for our Morningstar program. And then we do youth programming, prevention programming. So just trying to 
teach them about their culture and keep them connected with their culture to prevent them from kind of heading down that path. For the last uh, 38 years, we uh, take about 100 kids <laughs> to uh, a camp out near Lake Giacomo. Mm -hmm. It's pretty rewarding, and to connect them to their culture because sometimes they get a little bit, a little bit removed from their culture. They get a little bit removed from nature, from Earth. So, you know, just just having them come together like that is just very rewarding, and being proud to be Indian. We're a USDA distribution site, so we serve uh, for USDA uh, all Missouri residents that are within those guidelines. But then our food pantry program we serve uh, American Indian people. And on the Missouri side, um, we have a community services block grant that helps fund funding for that. But we're less than a mile from the Kansas side. So we also serve folks from there, but we get donations and of food or funds to, to, cover, the, to cover those folks. They can just be incredibly busy and Sometimes when people come in, they're just in so such a state and then, um, that the um, is, uh, they're really needing some help like today, you know. So whether they're needing help with housing or uh, any number of any number of things that they're needing assistance with, and we can't do everything here, but somebody in Kansas City is doing it, and we just have to be able to connect them to the right places, and sometimes that get them that warm call. So they're not just walking in someplace cold, they'll, they'll already have an appointment or they'll know a little bit about it or they're expecting them. There are challenges for Galen and staff, one being a leaky roof and the other, which is always a challenge, is to secure funding for programming and services. The biggest challenge for me <clears throat> is, is always just making sure there's money to pay all the bills. <laughs> and then um, right now, um, we have a leak in our roof and capital improvements are something that is, I am finding is incredibly difficult to fund. Um, most of the foundations will fund programs but not capital improvements. So we're getting closer but you know it's taken a lot of efforts to, to raise the funds and this year we sit on the city's complete count committee for the census. For Indian people, I think it's especially important because we're such a small percentage of the population to begin with. And then for any kind of funding to flow our way, we always have to justify it. And the way that we justify it is through the numbers of people. What I'd like to be able to do, you know, moving forward is really have a lot more culturally relevant activities for families. So there's a lot of things that I'd really love to be able to be doing and just kind of, you know, putting those seeds out there and, you know, who we can work with to make those kind of things happen. So I think, you know, we're raised to know that we're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to be good relatives to each other. And the fact that I can come here and do that every day, man, it's good stuff. Um, so yeah, I think I've got a few extra gray hairs, you know, from this challenge or that challenge or this frustration or that, but, but knowing that, that I made somebody's life a little bit easier today, you know, it's, it's worth it every time. Varicose veins are enlarged veins that usually affect the legs. Spider veins are smaller versions of them. Most of the time, they're asymptomatic, and as they become enlarged and twisted, they become a cosmetic issue. Sometimes they can be painful or can bleed. Thrombophlebitis is when they get clots in them. Varicose veins are due to a problem in the valves and veins. Blood has weight, and as the blood returns to the heart from the legs, there are valves that allow the blood to move forward. If these valves become damaged, they don't work as well, and the column of blood gets heavier and stretches out the vein. If you hold your hand down, the veins become larger due to the weight of the blood column, and you can see where the valves are by pushing back on the blood column, like this. When you raise your hand up, the veins go flat because that column of blood can move forward more easily without having to fight against gravity. Your arteries pump blood from your heart to all your tissues, and that system is under a higher pressure than venous pressure. 
Arteries are deeper, so they are better protected against damage. Veins are also in deeper tissues, but what you see on the surface are veins. The veins in your legs are the farthest from your heart. With standing and sitting during the day, the pressure from the weight of the blood column is continuous. When we are active and walking, the muscles in the legs help move the blood, and this is called the skeletal muscle pump. There are a bunch of risk factors for varicose veins. Valves in the veins can be damaged due to prolonged standing or sitting. Tight clothes in your waist or belt line area block the return blood flow. Age worsens this, as it just means there has been more time with gravity working against the valves. Women are more likely to get varicose veins because female hormones tend to relax the vein walls. Hormonal treatments such as birth control pills can also increase the risk of varicose veins. During pregnancy, there is more blood in your body to support the placenta. Combined with the hormonal changes, this can contribute to varicose veins. If other family members have varicose veins, there's a chance you will too. Obesity puts more pressure on the veins and is another risk factor. Preventing varicose veins is not always possible, but there are things you can do. These include regular exercise, maintaining a healthy weight, eating a low-salt, high-fiber diet, and changing your standing or sitting position regularly if your job is sedentary. Elevating your legs when you can will help take pressure off the veins. There are generally no special tests to diagnose varicose veins. Sometimes an ultrasound is needed if there is a concern for a blood clot. Treatment consists of the preventative measures already discussed. Compression stockings are simple and work very well to steadily squeeze your legs to help take the pressure off the valves. These can be purchased in drug stores and sometimes by prescription if insurance covers them. More complicated treatments include sclerotherapy, which means injecting a solution or a foam that scars and closes the veins. Laser treatments can be used on smaller varicose veins and spider veins. This sends an intense burst of light that scars and closes the vein. Catheter-assisted procedures use a thin tube with a tip that is heated by radio frequency or laser to collapse and seal the vein. There are surgical procedures that can be done to remove sections of the veins. These are generally done as an outpatient procedure. Insurance coverage might be an issue if the problem is cosmetic. As always, your health care provider is the first place to start. And remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vinio, and this is Health Matters. In 2002, Commander John Harrington became the first Native American from a federally recognized tribe to fly in space. Retired from the United States Navy and from NASA, Commander Harrington keeps busy by making personal appearances and presentations. We caught up with Commander Harrington while he was at the University of Wisconsin-Superior to ask about his life before, during, and after his time as an astronaut. If there is one story that is literally out of this world, it is that of retired astronaut John Harrington, who shared his career journey with UWS students, staff, and members of the Duluth Superior communities. Commander Harrington's story begins in a small town on the Oklahoma Plains. Well, I was born in a small, small town, Oklahoma, called in Wetumpka. It's, uh, it's just east of Oklahoma City, kind of southwest of Tulsa. I was born with the Creek Nation. I'm Chickasaw. My tribe is just across the Canadian River. The governor of my tribe says, you know, hey, you were, you were born on the other side of the river. Um, you know, I, I didn't grow up in Oklahoma, though. I moved a lot as a kid. You know, I've always been proud of my, my Chickasaw heritage. Great-grandmother, full-blood Chickasaw. You know, my heritage, uh, my tribal membership is based on her enrollment back years ago in the Dawes Roll, so if you're familiar. Um, but it's a, once again, it's a great opportunity to share my story, where I came from, from a small town, uh, with kids that may not think they have this opportunity. So I tell my story because I didn't do really well in school. When I started off in college, I wasn't a motivated student. I wasn't. I was a motivated rock climber. I spent most of my time rock climbing and a little of my time studying. If you don't study, you, know, you don't pass your test. And so I had a 1.72 grade point, got kicked out of school as a freshman. Um, took my job in the mountains as a rock climber. I worked on a survey crew. And, and so I, people in my life came along when I didn't necessarily expect it and encouraged me to do something I wasn't necessarily thinking about. Uh, the guy I worked for in the survey crew convinced me to go back to school, become an engineer. Uh, when I was a senior in college, I tutored a guy in calculus who happened to be f uh, fly fighters in World War II uh, that uh, encouraged me to join the Navy. So, you know, certain folks came along and, and made me think about something I hadn't thought about. Well, my dad was a pilot growing up. You know, he gave me my first flying lesson when I was like 10. He was an instructor. 
So I took for granted the fact I got to fly airplanes. I thought everybody flew airplanes as a kid. Uh, but I didn't get my pilot's license until I was actually in the Navy. So my father exposed me to aviation. Uh, my parents both liked uh, you know, air shows and airplanes. My mom learned to fly as well. So it's, uh, it was kind of a family thing. Commander Harrington has the distinction of being the first Native American from a federally recognized tribe to fly and walk in space. Not bad for a boy from a small town in Oklahoma. It's an opportunity for me to share my story with other kids or native that never had you know, somebody in that role. And so I have a neat opportunity and I really take it to heart. It's something I find that uh, it's really important that I share that story with others. What, what does it take to become an astronaut? You know, the reality is hard work. You know, uh, you have an advanced degree, a technical degree uh, in the sciences, engineering, something like, something like that. Uh, being able to work well with others, uh, being able to problem solve. You know, common sense plays a big part in a lot of what you do. Things don't always go as planned, certainly when you're spacewalking. Uh, happened to me. How do you overcome difficulties? Maybe your own fault or something else that's out there. And how do you use your common sense to work through a problem like that? How do you communicate that to folks you're talking to on the radio as well? So it's a, it's a whole bunch of things. You know, certainly an advanced degree, a technical degree, and work well in your field. What's it like being on the International Space Station? Uh, imagine a four-bedroom four, four bedroom house, essentially, where you can use everything, not just the floor. You know, you got the walls, the ceilings, you got the whole volume to, to work in. Uh, what I remember most about flying in space, it was not being there and looking back at the Earth, but it was the work I did. It was the work I did with some remarkable people. You start in little small steps. The launch is incredible. Uh, the first time you, uh, you know, take your seatbelt off and your harness, you start floating out of your chair, that gets your attention. So every kid's dream, you know, to be, able to be your own little spaceship and, and uh, tumble around, it's great. Well, on the space station, I, my primary job, our primary job on our mission was to take three people to space and bring three people home. Our secondary mission was to install a large truss on the outside of space station. So myself, another astronaut, Mike Lopez Alegria, uh, did three spacewalks and helped, uh, once it was installed, we helped remove all the launch locks, we had ammonia lines we had to connect, we had to put covers over batteries, just uh, a lot of mechanical work. And when I interviewed to be an astronaut, I said I wanted to turn a wrench in space, and I got to do it. It's moving at a rate that, you know, you're, if you imagine the Earth is a 16-inch diameter beach ball, the space shuttle and space station are about a finger width above it, but you're moving really fast, you know, 17,500 miles an hour. So it takes 90 minutes to go around the Earth. Um, and you just look down and you see places you grew up, you see places where you hiked as a kid or went backpacking, and, and it takes you there, but you can't see it. You can't, you see the macro of it, but not the micro. You don't see the people. It makes you feel really small. The passion and drive he had to go back to school is matched by his passion and drive to make educational outreach presentations such as this one. And for Commander Harrington, it means raising awareness for science, technology, engineering, and math education. Um, my research is in, in education, my PhD is in education, and the idea is working with students, working with their hands, and being able to work as a group and hands-on learning. Uh, find something you love to do, and if it takes you down the path to be an astronaut or whatever your, your goal in life is, make sure you talk to the people that are doing it. You know, talk to the folks that are in the role that you would like as a career. Uh, don't go off with this fantasy of what it is. Talk to them and see if it's actually something you would like to do. And then work hard at it. And work hard at it or work well with others. That's, you'll take you down a path that you may not expect. And to be able to, to bring my story back to places that uh, need to hear the story, uh, I'm glad I get a chance to do it. This we put on our campus, uh, this medicine wheel image and spirit bird. This is about 200 feet across. It's on our south campus and we did it because we thought it was a symbolic way of representing who we were. The sacred circle, some people call it the medicine wheel, mm -hmm. the four directions, the spirit bird approaching from the east. So I'd say if you get a chance, one of the things that distinguishes us, we're probably I think there is at least one, maybe two other colleges in the United States that have a functioning wetlands mm. on their campus. And our campus consists of, a, of a class two wet, uh, wetlands. And this is just to the north of that wetlands area. This, this, we call it the Haskell Medicine Wheel. But if you get a chance, this is where we've got the best outdoor classroom, environmental science learning lab you could ever have. And we can walk down there, right in our backyard.
Linda Black Elk is an ethnobotanist, meaning she studies a region's plants and their practical uses through the traditional knowledge of local culture and people. Linda learned about medicinal plants from her mother and grandmother and knew from a young age that she was destined to be a healer. She aims to build a bridge between ancestral wisdom and modern science. My grandmother practiced plant medicine, um, and then my mother, who's actually um, Mongolian um, and a descendant of the Dukkha people, she did a lot of edible and medicinal plants when I was growing up as well. That knowledge Linda Black Elk gained through her mother and grandmother and through academia is something she shares freely with others. Tonight, Linda is at the Dr. Robert Paulus Cultural Center to demonstrate how to make a salve and a tea. I will be uh, working with a lot of mothers-to-be, but also people who are already um, parents, and we will be making a really wonderful medicinal salve. We're also making a really wonderful tea, one of my favorites, um, and it's a tea that's very high in vitamin C, so it'll be great for these winter months when we might not be feeling that well, um, but it's also great for mothers-to-be. It's uh, relaxing, but it's also very nourishing, um, and it even helps with milk production. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of medicinal plants growing all around us. I remember I was actually in this building earlier this year and I probably found within um, 10 feet of this building, I found about 25 medicinal plants, even here in this very urban setting. Um, and so when I say medicinal plants, I don't mean plants that heal us merely physically, right? Because a lot of us think of illness as being something physical, but as an indigenous woman, as um, an indigenous ethnobotanist, I think of illness, I think of healing, I think of wellness as being something that's physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And so when I talk about medicinal plants, I'm talking about plants that help to heal us within all those realms or that help to keep us well. Linda strives to preserve traditional plant knowledge, but her larger mission is to bridge that knowledge with modern medicine. It's interesting in the Western world or what some people consider the mainstream, for them scientist, science is this separate academic discipline, right? It's something that people do um, or something that people sort of study. Um, but for indigenous people, science is a part of our everyday lives, and it's actually become, native science has become an academic discipline. We know that we have a vast, um, specific, important relationship with the environment, with everything in the environment. Uh, we are not separate from it, and um, we are the first scientists of this land. We know this land more intimately, better than any Western scientist that I've personally ever met. Um, and just because we haven't written down the studies that we've done, it doesn't mean that we haven't actually been practicing the scientific method from the very beginning. We've always been experimenting. We've always been observing. We's, we've always been looking at our results and perhaps uh, revising our hypotheses as we went along. Um, and I, th I think that's really important for people to know. We are the original scientists. I actually call myself an indigenous ethnobotanist um, just because it is very different. Ethnobotany is an academic discipline um, in which they discuss the um, relationship between people and plants. You know, it's just a relationship. But as a native woman, um, that's a little different for me because uh, I really talk about the spiritual relationship between myself and plants um, and between my people and plants a lot more than, say, a non-native academic ethnobotanist. Linda's workshops are popular across Indian country, and most, if not all, are well attended like tonight's session. And this tells her that she is not the only one who wishes to learn more about traditional foods and medicines. People are hungry for our knowledge on traditional plants, whether it is knowledge about um, what we can eat or what we can use for medicine. Um, our people really want this. Our people still retain so much of this knowledge. Every time I teach, every time I give a workshop, I learn something new from my people. 
Another thing that I'm always really happy about is that I'll get calls months later from people who are saying, you know, I took your workshop, I learned how to make a salve, and I'm changing it up a little. I'm going to add another plant to this. Uh, it's a plant that my, you know, one of my grandparents told me about when I was growing up, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. So I love hearing that people are taking that a step further. So I've given these workshops all in indigenous communities all over the world, even in Australia and, and um, in Mongolia. And um, I always find that it's really well received everywhere. Our traditional plant knowledge is just as reliable, just as valid as the stuff that you get in the pharmacy uh, down the street. Um, and, and that's not to say that I'm not thankful for Western medicine, because I am, but I know that the knowledge of my ancestors has been tested over millennia uh, by numerous people, and I trust it. Uh, I always say go to your elders, go to, because because they still have all of this. There, there are people out there who, who have so much knowledge, way more than what I have. All you have to do is seek it out. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors from across Indian Country. I'm Michael Lagarde. Join us next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Thank you.